welcome back to part 2 of this tutorial project using Blackmagic Fusion in DaVinci Resolve. In part 1 we imported an FBX file containing a simple 3D scene. It was a bit of an effort to sort out the lights, textures and materials but that's behind us now and we can start the fun stuff, adding special effects such as flickering lights, heat shimmer, lens distortion, depth of field and so on. These are really just suggestions to get you going, you should feel free to cut loose and try stuff out. I think it makes sense to start with the effects which are big, bold and noticeable, and in this case that means setting fire to the sun. So I'll add a raise node for some good old fashioned god rays. The defaults are actually not bad, I'll just drop the weight to about 2. Now unlike the real sun I want this to flicker quite violently, and I found that animating the blend attribute works pretty well. Instead of keyframing it manually, Fusion has an excellent noise modifier for wobbling and flickering parameters. I'll right click on Blend and modify it with Perturb. If you press play you can see the slider going up and down. I'll switch to the Modifiers tab to see the new modifier I just created. Before I start adjusting parameters, it'll be good to get some visual feedback, so I'll open the Spline Editor and turn on Show Only Selected Tool, and then check the Blend parameter so that I can see the animation graph while I adjust the Perturb parameters. As you can see, the speed parameter adjusts the frequency, the strength slider is the amplitude, and the value slider offsets the entire graph up or down. Most of the time you can just leave wobble at the default value, but in case you're interested you can use it to add secondary noise to the graph when the speed is low like this. To be honest, all these brightness and intensity values in different nodes tend to affect each other, so it's too early to refine them much. These are the values I ended up with by the time I reached the end of the project and went back and forth with various tweaks. Ok, it's about time this video lived up to its namesake, in other words, let's add some glow. First I'll add an ordinary glow node with a size of 6 pixels and a glow of 0.25. So it's quite tight and helps to soften some of the high contrast edges. Then I'll add a soft glow node. This is my favourite glow node, because the threshold parameter lets you control which areas of the image will be affected. Only pixels with a brightness value above the threshold will produce glow. I'll tame it with the blend slider. I'll make the size about 60 pixels or so, which is very large, because I want this to act a bit like an atmospheric haze, and bump up the gain a little. It would be a travesty not to add some heat shimmer, so I'm going to use both distortion and blur to help sell that really intense heat. The warp folder in the effects library has all the tools you need for distorting 2D images, so I'll add a displace tool to the end of my flow, and connect a fast noise node to that, so that it drives the distortion. I'll bump up the noise scale to about 10, so that it's quite detailed. Now I'll switch to the displace node, and you can see that the refraction strength slider controls the amount of distortion. The displacement type is radial, which means that it's scaling pixels inwards or outwards around the centre of the image. The white regions of the noise will cause the most displacement, and the black regions cause no displacement. The radial type is the easiest to use, but it does tend to cause more distortion around the edges of the frame than in the centre, which is pretty much the opposite of what I'm aiming for. If I bump up the refraction strength to 0.3, the sun geometry in the centre of the frame looks about right, but the concentric rings are looking a bit ridiculous, so I'll limit the distortion effect to the centre of the frame by applying an elliptical mask to the noise node. Of course, I'll soften that for a nice gradual fall off. I think it looks about right for the start of the animation when we're staring into the sun, but if I jump forward to the end when the text appears, it's just too much distortion and it's looking like a funhouse mirror, so I'm just going to keyframe the amount of distortion to gradually decrease. At frame 50 I'll set a keyframe on the refraction strength parameter by clicking on the diamond icon so that it's 0.3, then I'll jump to frame 150 just as the text appears. I'll reduce that to about half as much, in other words 0.15. Just changing that value will automatically set a keyframe. Ok, I'll just jump forward and check that, and it looks like a reasonable amount of distortion. 
Next, I'll need to animate the distortion. If I drag the Seethe slider on the Fast Noise node, you can see a nice rippling effect. Now, I could keyframe the Seethe parameter, but instead, I'll just set the Seethe rate, which has the same effect. I think 0.2 should be fast enough. So that takes care of the heat distortion, but there's another effect associated with heat haze, namely blur. I'll add an ordinary blur node with a blur size of 4 pixels, and another fast noise node to mask the blur effect, since I only want to blur some tiny parts of the image. This may not be very scientific, but I can imagine some thin vertical strips of blur, so I'll tweak the noise parameters to give me something like that. I don't want to blur too much of the image, so I'll adjust the brightness and contrast parameters so that the mask is mostly black, with some strips of white. Of course, it needs to shimmer, so I'll give it a sieve rate of 0.2. For faster playback, I'll just view the noise and press play, and the sieve rate looks about right. Now, if I take a closer look at the blur node, I can see the overall effect. It's pretty subtle, but I think that's okay. I think it adds just a little to the overall visual chaos, which is good. When evaluating quite subtle effects like this, I'll sometimes just press Ctrl P to toggle pass through for a quick before and after comparison. Ok, in my opinion we've got most of the important elements in place. There are two other effects which I consider pretty major, and those are depth of field and motion blur but I won't add those yet because they can be quite slow to render, and sluggish playback is not my idea of a good time. I'll save them until the very end, but not because I think they're unimportant. I quite like the idea of adding just a little bit of lens distortion, so that subconsciously it looks a bit more like it was shot through a real camera lens. If objects get a bit distorted near the edge of the frame, that's the kind of visual chaos I'm looking for. If I jump to near the end, I'm also noticing that the title band is really kind of bulging in the middle and tapering on the sides, which isn't really the effect that I'm aiming for. That's mostly just because of how I set it up in the 3D scene, but maybe I can kill two birds with one stone here. I'll add a lens distort node to the end of the flow, and I'll set the distortion model to the first one labelled fisheye. I think that's better. Though, it just occurred to me that a lot of that bulge is probably coming from the displacement node I added for the heat shimmer. It's scaling pixels away from the centre, which is probably causing a bulge. But if I change the refraction strength parameter to a negative number, it will scale the pixels inwards instead. A lot like the lens distort node. I'll try that, and because I keyframed the refraction strength slider, I'll need to change both of those keyframes to have a negative value. Ok, well that worked a little too well. It's now sort of pinching the centre of the image. The lens distort node is doing the same thing, which is a bit much. It's up to you, but I think it now looks better without the lens distort, so I'll disable that, but leave it there in case I want to come back to it. Ok, looking at what we've got so far, I'm not very happy with the appearance of the sunray geometry, which radiates outwards from the core. The texture's kind of grainy, and it's very static, and the tips are a little too dark. I blame you. What the hell were you thinking? The material in question is named Sunray's material, and I'll build a new texture map for that from scratch. Now, I happen to know that the UVs on the mesh look like this. So, if I create a background node and set it to vertical gradient, I have a gradient running from the hub to the rim. I'll drag the gradient's output knot onto the material's diffuse colour input knot. That automatically breaks the old connection from the shitty texture map. Now I can futz with the gradient colours and get some real time feedback. Now to make the texture animated and less uniform, we're going to use a plasma node. Seriously, how often do you get to use the plasma node? The colours are a bit garish, but I'm only going to use the brightness values. I want it to boil and seethe like the sun, and if I switch to the colour tab and drag the phase slider, you can see that it's pretty much the same as the seethe parameter on the noise node. I could keyframe it, but for fun, let's use an expression. I can just type equals time divided by 30 into the numeric field, and the equals sign tells Fusion that it's an expression. Now I'll merge the plasma on top of the gradient,
and I'll set the apply mode to luminosity. It's very high contrast, so I'll drop the blend to 0.2. Because the god rays are flickering, it's a little hard to judge how bright the gradient colors should be, but I think it's a bit too bright, so I'll pull that back. Conventional wisdom says that having large parts of the image completely blown out to pure white is just plain bad, but because it's not on every frame, and because this is supposed to be burning violently, I think we can get away with it. I also think the plasma texture is a bit too detailed and fiddly, so I'll bump the scale up to 1.5. All the glow and so on makes the material hard to make out, so I'll view the render node just to evaluate the material. Ok, call me fussy, but it looks to me like the plasma is moving inwards towards the sun, so I'll reverse the direction by putting a minus sign in front of the phase expression. Ok, you can't really point a camera lens directly at the sun without expecting at least some kind of lens flare. Infusion has plenty on offer. If you open the effects library and expand the templates category near the bottom, you'll find dozens of lens flare presets, which you can experiment with. So I just grabbed one at random and dumped it into the flow without much enthusiasm, because to be honest I think I was traumatised by the overuse of lens flares in the 1990s and have never quite recovered, so my heart just isn't in it. You'll have to go on without me. I'm sure you'll come up with something much better than I did in any case. Actually I did do one interesting thing with the lens flare, which was to make the intensity of the flare flicker in sync with the flicker we already added to the raise node. In other words, I wanted the blend parameter to wobble up and down, but instead of creating a brand new perturb modifier, I connected it to the existing one. Which is easy, just right click on the blend parameter and choose connect to perturb one value. As you can see from that pop-up menu, you can connect to modifiers and animation curves even when they're on other nodes. We're almost at the finish line, and it's finally time to add depth of field. Fusion offers two main approaches for this, and I'm such a fan of depth of field I'll show you both of them. The first approach is called depth blur, because it uses a depth channel, or Z channel, to decide which regions of the image to blur. So I'll start by turning on the Z channel of my renderer node. If I want to see the depth channel, I can set the viewer to display it. And if it's mostly white or mostly black, you can view a normalized version. But to be honest, I usually just rely on the feedback bar at the very bottom, which shows the exact Z value of the pixel beneath the mouse pointer. As you can see, Fusion uses negative Z values, so the sun core has a depth of about minus 15, and this foreground ring is about minus 4. Next, I'll add a depth blur node just after the render node and load it in the viewer. The default blur size is only 1 pixel, so I'll bump that up to 7 pixels. Depending on the range of depth values in your scene, you'll usually need to decrease the Z scale parameter to get better behavior from the other parameters. I'll try dropping mine all the way to 15. The focal point parameter defines which distance from the camera should be in focus. A handy way to set that is to click and hold on the sample button and drag it onto the image. Whatever I drag it onto will pop into focus. Now obviously this whole depth blur approach is a cheat. It's a lot like taking an ordinary 2D image, adding a blur node, and then masking the areas you want to blur. Except of course the mask is generated automatically using the depth values. So it has a number of downsides, probably the biggest being that boundaries between blurred and unblurred regions tend to be problematical and may look bad. But this approach has lots of advantages too. It renders quickly, and the blur is very smooth, not grainy. And if you've rendered images outside Fusion, depth blur may be your only option. So it's a great technique to keep in your bag of tricks. Now let's look at the other approach to rendering depth of field. I'll get rid of the depth blur node and turn off the Z channel on the renderer, since this approach doesn't use a depth channel. On the render node, I'll scroll down to accumulation effects and turn those on. You can see the effect right away, because the default amount of blur is 0.2, which is very high. 
but before I turn that down we can take a closer look at the blur effect and notice that it's not very smooth. It looks a lot like the original image has been stacked on top of itself multiple times, each with a small offset, which is of course exactly what it's doing. Fusion renders the current frame multiple times with the position of the camera slightly jitted to simulate the way an open aperture on a camera gathers light from an area, not a single point. Obviously it's a hack and it can't hold a candle to a path tracing renderer, but compared to the depth blur approach it's closer to being physically accurate. The downsides are that it's slower and it can be a bit grainy depending on the size of the blur and the number of samples. For this project it should be fine, so let's run with it. I'll drop the amount of blur down to something more reasonable, and to control the focal distance I'll need to pop over to the camera node. And don't forget to unlock the node. By the way, if I look at the 3D scene in the viewer, and I turn on focal plane visibility on the camera node, I should be able to see a 3D plane showing me the focal distance from the camera. But in this version of DaVinci Resolve I can't see squat, so maybe it's a bug. In any case, I'll just have to eyeball it. Now at the beginning of the animation, obviously I want the sun to be in focus. So I'll go to frame 50 and keyframe the focal plane to about 20 or so. And at frame 150 I need the text to be in focus. So I'll keyframe the focal plane to about 4.2, which I remember being the depth value for that geometry. And that's it for depth of field. The final effect we'll add is some motion blur. This can also be very expensive to calculate, which is why I've left it for last. I'll right click next to the transport controls and turn motion blur on in the viewers. Then I'll go to the settings tab of the renderer node and turn on motion blur. I'll look for a frame with some rapid motion, and frame 90 or so looks ideal. Before doing a final render, I'll want to bump up the quality a bit, but that'll really slow things down, so I'll leave it at 2 for now. To adjust the length of the blur, you can set the shutter angle to anywhere from 0 to 360 degrees. And that's a wrap for the entire project. However yours turned out, I hope you had some fun along the way. See you next time. <laughs>